a series in the book of James, thinking about living undivided Christian lives. So you can keep your Bibles open at James chapter 3. You can refer to the uh, outline that is uh, on your chairs there as, as well. Uh, let, me, let me lead us in, in prayer, uh, and then we can look at God's Word together. Our Heavenly Father, your, our words are destructive, but yours are life-giving. Our words hurt but yours are powerful for salvation. Help me now, Lord, to, by your Spirit, to preach your word faithfully. And as we listen, may your Spirit be at work, changing our hearts from within, that from our hearts may come forth a river of pure and honorable speech to the glory of your name. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do your words reflect a heart that loves God? Do your words reflect a heart that loves God? Uh, My guess is that most of us spend about as much time thinking about our speech as we do thinking about how to wash the dishes uh, or how to shower correctly. Uh, Of course, we know showering and uh, washing dishes is essential. I hope you agree that. Uh, They're not things that we can ignore, but we rarely stop to think about it very much. Rather than stopping to think, you know, is this gossip? Is this true? Is this encouraging? Is this helpful? Normally, we just blurt out the first thing that comes to our minds uh, when we're frustrated about something that's happening at church or we're disappointed with our family or our colleague is being difficult. We don't usually think much about what we should say. The words just blow out like a river. Uh, I think very often we underestimate the power of words, their permanence, their destructiveness, their unruliness. But James warns us in this passage here not to underestimate our speech. He tells us it's crucial that the gospel not only transforms our hearts uh, and our heads, but it transforms our speech so that we are so transformed by God's gracious gift of salvation through his son that our speech shines forth in this pure pure and honorable way uh, to his glory. Now, we've seen so far that James's primary concern in this letter is that we have an undivided faith where what is on the outside matches what is on the inside in our hearts. He wants us to have a living faith, a a faith that bears fruit in good works. And so he's urged us to be doers of the word, not hearers only. Uh, He's warned us that faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, is dead. And James has already warned us that a key fruit of a living faith is our speech. He said in chapter 1, verse 26, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. So James says don't be deceived. If your speech does not match your faith, then you are a self-deceived person. Your, Your religion is worthless. Because true faith will result in renewed speech. Uh, And it's that topic that James turns to at length here in chapter 3. It's a new section in the letter. He's dealing specifically now with conflicts in the church. Uh, It's no surprise then that he starts with how we speak to one another. So let us be slow to speak, quick to listen to God's word this morning. Three points we'll look at. Our speech is powerful. Our speech is dangerous. Our speech reflects our hearts. Let's begin. Our speech is powerful. Well, James uh, introduces the topic by talking about the serious business of preaching. You see in verse 1, Not many of you should become uh, teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Uh, Teachers have a very important part to play in the life of the church because the gospel is not something that you can simply think up by your own imagination. Uh, It has to be taught to you. Uh, And teaching the gospel is a noble task that carries with it great uh, authority and respect. But it also carries with it a great responsibility as well. Uh, Perhaps in James's day, uh, much like in our own day, Sometimes people want to become teachers in the church or leaders in the church because of the status attached to it. They like uh, people looking up to them. They like approval. They like people listening to them. uh, And so they want to become teachers. But James is quick to warn us here that being a teacher is serious business. He says that the Bible teacher will be held uh, accountable to God. They will be judged with greater 
strictness, that is, a failure to teach properly, will bring with it a more severe penalty. Now, James, as he often does in this letter, is simply echoing the teaching of Jesus. Uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 12, everyone to whom much is given, of him much will be required. From him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand uh, the more. And so if you have a greater responsibility as a teacher, then it comes with a greater accountability. Now, that doesn't mean that we should dissuade people from becoming uh, teachers uh, of God's word. The church, of course, desperately needs more people who will be Bible teachers, who will faithfully preach the gospel. But it does mean that such people should be tested first. They should not be allowed to enter the ministry without being properly instructed in God's word first and assessed in their godly living. Why is that? was because at the heart of teaching God's word is speaking. And speaking, we're told in this passage, is a very dangerous business. Uh, the commentator Douglas Moo, he writes this, teachers are especially vulnerable to failures of speech because their role demands that they speak so much. More words mean more errors. As we grow accustomed to public speaking, we can become careless. When asked to offer opinions, we comply even if we have scant qualifications and little factual basis. Now, I want to say up front, I'm sorry if I have failed in this area, failed in my speech, failed in my actions. If I have failed you in some way as a teacher, then please show grace to me. Uh, please forgive me. None of us are perfect, although we are all called to strive towards it. That's what James tells us in the next verse. He says in verse 2, For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle his whole body. So he's saying here that sin is a universal human experience. It takes all kinds of forms. Some of us here will st struggle with greed. Some of us will struggle with pride. Some of us will be struggling with impatience and anger. Some of us will be struggling with impurity and lust. But it doesn't matter what our particular struggle is, our particular sin is. James says there is one sin that we all share, and that is we all sin with our speech. We twist the truth. We gossip. We have impure jokes. We say hurtful, biting words. Uh, we slander others' reputation, and so on. If you think of the lion as the king of the jungle, then the tongue is the king of the body. It is so difficult to control. It is so given to uttering false, biting words. It is so prone to speaking things when it should really just stay shut. James says if we could control our tongues, we could control our whole bodies. We would be perfect. Christians. And of course, that's James's aim as he writes this letter. Chapter 1 told us that he wants us to be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But we cannot live a perfect and complete Christian life unless we learn to control our tongues, because the tongue is powerful. Now, James gives us two examples in verses 3 to 5 to show us how influential, how powerful the tongue is. Verse 3, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. They are so large and are driven by strong winds, yet they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. It's not hard to get the point, is it? In both cases, you have a small object controlling a whole body. You know, the horse, the little bit in the mouth, you can, uh, you, you can control a racehorse and make it go where you want. Or a ship, some of us went on the Logos ship when it was here. Just a very small rudder, you can direct that massive ship wherever you want it to go. The point is, it's very easy to underestimate our speech. But James warns us, although our tongue is just a very small part of our body, it will determine the destiny of our lives. It will, it, it, will, it will determine whether we take our divinely charted course, that we move towards being perfect and complete in our faith, or whether our life ends up drifting off course, drifting into the rocks. Our religion becomes hypocritical and worthless. Our faith is empty. 
James is saying our speech matters because our words are powerful. We must not underestimate how much damage a loose word could inflict. Well, that brings us to the second point uh, this morning. Our speech is destructive. Our speech is destructive. Our, our speech can destroy lives like a blazing fire. Verse 5 continues, How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. James wants us to open our eyes and see what our tongues are really like. And the image he chooses to adopt here is that of a fire. Uh, you may know that this year Canada suffered the worst wildfires that are ever recorded. There's a, there's a picture of one of them there. They started in March and they're still burning now in October. Uh, already they have consumed 5% of the entire forested area of Canada, 184,000 square kil kil kilometres. Now that might not mean much to you, but that is an area roughly half the size of Malaysia. Uh, it is larger than the entirety of West Malaysia, burned up by fire. Small flame can do enormous damage. James tells us the tongue has an enormous capacity to destroy the lives of others. It's true, isn't it? A, a throwaway comment could be remembered for decades. You're good for nothing. I wish I never married you. I hate you. I, mean, I can still remember some words that I was teased with when I was in primary school. I won't tell you what they were. I can still remember some uh, honest but difficult words spoken to me by a former church leader of mine in Australia. A, a, a few words can cause a great deal of damage. You can remember them for a very long time. Our tongues are immensely powerful and destructive. We must not underestimate them. Uh, James says in verse 6, the tongue is a world of unrighteousness. What James means is that the tongue is the focal point of all the evil that is within us. Now, our words reveal all the other sins, the selfishness, the pride, the anger, the bitterness, the envy, and, and, and all the other unrighteous deeds that are, are dwelling in our hearts. It all comes out through our tongues. In other words, the tongue is the gateway to the soul. Every evil in our heart is expressed with our speech. And James is echoing here the teaching of the Lord Jesus. It's done Matthew chapter 15. Jesus says, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. To eat with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. The, the tongue is the focal point of all the evil within us. Secondly, he talks about the corruption of the tongue. Verse 6 continues, the tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body. That is, everywhere the tongue, everywhere the tongue makes its presence felt. It leaves its stain. I mean, perhaps you have met someone who speaks in unpleasant ways. Maybe they swear. Maybe they always uh, grumble and complain. Maybe they tell crude jokes. Uh, maybe they're known to criticize or put other people down. Uh, you cannot help but view that person in the light of their words. You, you can't help but judge their character by the words that they speak. Uh, the point is that the unrighteous speech, it, it corrupts the whole of their bodies. It's the same for us, isn't it? The way that we speak can destroy our character. The way we speak can tarnish our reputation. Evil words show a person to be evil. Evil words defile us. But we saw in chapter 1, verse 27, God doesn't want us to be defiled. He wants us to be pure and undefiled in our religion. He wants us to be unstained from the world. Well, thirdly, James identifies the consequences of the tongue. He says in verse 6, our fiery tongues set on fire the entire course of life. Uh, what James means is that our tongues don't just destroy our character in the present, but our tongues end up destroying the whole of our life from the beginning to the end. John Calvin says this, other vices are corrected by age or process of time. 
they drop off from our lives, but from earliest to later days, the destructive influence of the tongue remains. So whether you're the child that is always uh, whinging and complaining, uh, or you are the parent who is enraged by their grumbling children, uh, or it's the worker who boasts of all their achievements, the friend who gossips, the retiree who is bitter, the grumpy old man in the nursing home, the tongue's fiery effects are, are there of all of life from beginning to the end. And we're told not only does the tongue set on fire the entire course of life, but verse 6 says the tongue itself is set on fire by hell. Uh, hell is the place of fire. Uh, James sees the fires of hell reaching up to our tongues. Uh, in other words, a fiery tongue reflects the character of Satan himself. And I think the point here is that one day such a fiery tongue affected by the devil like this, if it's not brought under control, then it will join Satan in the fires of hell. He's saying that fiery tongues lead people to hell. The point is this. We need to put, we need to, to deal with our speech before our tongues destroy us and destroy others. It's serious business. The question, though, is how? How can a raging fire be brought under control? It's not that easy, is it? There's a reason why the wildfires in Canada are still burning after nine, uh, six, uh, six or seven months. Well, in verses 7 to 8, James identifies one more feature of our tongue, and that is its uncontrollability. Verse 7, he says, Every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, I wonder if any of you have heard of Steve Irwin before, uh, the famous Australian animal tamer. I'm from, uh, I'm from Australia myself. Uh, I don't like to play with crocodiles, personally. I prefer to avoid uh, snakes and stingrays and, and all the rest. But yeah, this, uh, this Steve, Steve Irwin, if you've uh, ever watched any of his uh, shows, he would like to uh, swim with uh, sharks, he would like to wrestle with crocodiles, he would dance with snakes, uh, and so on. Uh, humanity was made in the image of God to rule over the world. Uh, Steve Irwin was a master with animals. Uh, human beings, we have zoos full of animals. Uh, we have uh, horses to ride. Some of us like to do that here. Dogs will be our loyal servants. Even parrots will try to talk to us. But the great Steve Irwin, even he could not control every animal. You might know he eventually got uh, stung by a giant stingray which killed him. The question is, so with our tongues, how can they be tamed? How can the, the destructive fire be put out? Like a child that cannot sit still, our tongues cannot stop spewing forth filth. It's as if our tongues were half-tamed beasts that are tamed for a moment and then turn on us and savage others to death. Now, I'm sure you can understand that James's assessment of our tongues is rather accurate, isn't it? I mean, as you look back on your own life, how many words have you said that you regret? You know, that you wish that you could take back, but you know that you can't. Now, you're a failure. I'm never speaking to you again. You're such a disappointment, these things that we say. Now, of course, it's, he's not just talking about the outbursts that we have when we're angry. Elsewhere in the book, James talks about many kinds of speech. He talks about fights and quarrels. He talks about speaking anger against another person, chapter 4, verse 11. He talks about arrogance and boasting, chapter 4, verse 13. He talks about grumbling about others, chapter 5, verse 9. He talks about false oaths and lies in chapter 5, verse 12. I thought it's helpful we just focus on a few of these for a moment. Firstly, let's think about the sin of grumbling. Uh, James says in chapter 5 and verse 9, Do not grumble against one another, brothers so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge standing at the door. Are you in the habit of grumbling? Grumbling about this, the uh, symptoms of your sickness? 
grumbling that your family doesn't come to visit you, uh, grumbling about the food that you are served, grumbling about the mistakes that happen in government, grumbling about money running short, grumbling about your colleagues, your housemates, uh, your DG, your church leaders. Grumblers are like gloomy clouds on a stormy day. And it's just not meant to be in the Christian life. Remember the Israelites, they grumbled in the desert and God's judgment came severely upon them. The Pharisees grumbled against Christ and he denounced them as hypocrites. And James tells us Christians will be judged too if they are grumblers. It just doesn't fit in the Christian life. The second uh, thing he talks about is slander. He says this in chapter 4, verse 11. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But who are you to judge your neighbor? It's very easy, isn't it, to spread uh, gossip, uh, to spread malicious words about people who've upset us, to try and tear other people down, to ruin their reputation. We must be very careful about how we speak about each other. We must be very careful about pronouncing judgment on each other and especially about spreading gossip. I think one of the problems I've noticed in this community is that sometimes we have the habit of complaining uh, about people to others instead of going to the person that has uh, upset us. We must not do that kind of thing. It's actually very damaging. It only makes things worse. Uh, very often the reason that we do that, I take it, is because we want to feel vindicated or maybe we want to get some kind of uh, revenge against the person who hurt us and so we say bad things about them to others. Or well, other times it's not so much what we say but how we say it. So maybe we speak to one another, we have a critical tone or we're condescending or uh, we're not very gracious or gentle. James is reminding us here, our speech really matters. Speech can be dangerous. It can be destructive. We must be aware of the havoc that it could wreak among us or in our families or our workplaces if we don't learn to control it. If we are to be perfect and complete, if we are to dwell together in unity and love, we must learn to bridle our tongues. But again, the question is, how? How can the tongue be tamed? Because James says no one, no human being can tame it. He says it's an uncontrollable thing. He says it's impossible to change your speech by your own strength. But he clearly expects us to do so, doesn't he? And what's going on here? How are we meant to do it? Well, of course, James is hinting at the solution here. Uh, no human being can tame the tongue means it must be God who does it. And so I think James shows us the way forward in the final part of the passage. This is point three. Our speech reflects our hearts. Our speech reflects our hearts. So often the problem is that we do not speak according to our nature. We say that we are Christians who love the Lord, but our speech says otherwise. In other words, our speech is divided. He says in verse eight, the tongue is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be. So he's saying, look, on the one hand, we come to church, uh, we sing God's praises, we bless God in our prayers, we reflect on the glory of Christ, the image of God, and so on. And then we go off to lunch, or we go back home, and we grumble, we complain, we criticize, we discourage. He's saying, look, it's a, it's a terrible hypocrisy. He says, my brothers, these things ought not to be. How can you be divided like this? He describes God as our Lord and Father. That is, he is our creator on the one hand, but he's also perfectly good. He's the father of lights from whom every good gift comes, including fellow human beings made in his image. What a travesty to curse another human being. Now, when he says cursing here, he doesn't so much mean about uh, saying swear words at them or something like that. 
but cursing in the sense that you wish they go to hell, that they come under the judgment of God. I mean, what, what a double-minded evil that is, to bless God and then wish that others go to hell. No. Now, I hope, again, you can feel the, the tension here. How can we make progress? If, it's a, if, it, if the tongue is ready to breathe out deadly poison, then how can we hope that our speech will be anything but divided? It seems like the bar is placed too high for us. Now, we, we need to remember here, James is not advocating salvation by works. He's not saying, unless you have perfect speech, you can't enter the kingdom of God. That's not the point here. James just simply wants our actions on the outside to match our hearts on the inside. He wants there to be no division about who we really are and, and how we act towards others. And so with the last few illustrations, he takes us to the core of the problem as well as the way forward. Verse 11 says, Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives? Or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. So James gives us two examples here where something cannot produce two things at the same time. It's not difficult to understand. The first is a stream. You can't have a stream that has fresh water and salt water coming out at the same time. It just doesn't work like that. The second example, a tree. A fig tree can only bear figs. You're not going to plant a fig tree and it starts growing grapes or something like that. It just doesn't work like that. You can't plant a durian tree and then harvest mangosteens from it. It just doesn't work like that. And with these examples, he's showing us the heart of the issue. Just as water reflects its source, just as the fruit reflects the type of the tree, so if our speech is evil, then it reflects a problem that is in our hearts. It's from the overflow of our hearts that the mouth speaks. And again, James has got this teaching straight from the Lord Jesus Christ. This time is Matthew chapter 12. Jesus says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good. And the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. Jesus is very clear here. If our speech is not good on the outside, then the only explanation for that is we have evil hearts on the inside. Because our tongue is simply a reflection of our hearts. And so in the same passage, Jesus continues with some very scary words. Verse 36, he says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. The point is this, because our words are a reflection of our hearts, they can be the basis for God's final judgment. Pure speech will inevitably flow from a pure heart. And so an, so an evil heart will inevitably spew forth evil speech. That's what James means when he says a, a fiery tongue will be set on fire by hell. It's not justification by works. It's just simply saying that the fruit of our lips shows what we're really like on the, evil, on, on the inside. It's scary, isn't it? You and I will have to give account for every careless word we've spoken, every angry criticism, Every derogatory joke, every frustrated outburst, every deceptive lie, every baseless gossip is frankly terrifying, isn't it? To know that God has it all written down. Our words matter because they show what our heart is like. And so I hope you can see then that the solution is not just, just to try harder to speak better, you know, to... Maybe put up a poster on your wall, you know, speak nice to people or something like that. It's not going to work, is it? I mean, you can put up a poster, you'll see it for one day, and then you'll ignore it for the remaining time after that. You cannot tame an unruly tongue by trying harder. It's not a self-help 
kind of thing. It's not going to work. If the speech is going to change, then the heart must change. If our speech is fiery, our fiery, fiery hearts needs, some, uh, needs to be addressed. What we need is not a tongue operation. What we need is heart replacement surgery. And as we know, heart transformation is something that only God can do through his gospel. So as we conclude then, let's turn our eyes again to the gospel and the glorious transformation it can bring in our lives. You remember again what James said in chapter 1, verse 19. Let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So we can't change our speech by our own effort. It is the implanted word, the gospel, that is able to save us. And not only save us, but this gospel word can transform our hearts if only we will receive it with meekness. See, what we need to do is stop speaking and start listening again to what God has done for us in his Son. Listen again to this glorious description of the Lord Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter writes, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. You see, where, where we have failed so miserably with our speech, Jesus always succeeded. Jesus never sinned, even with his tongue. That's remarkable, isn't it? Jesus never gossiped. He never lied. He never slandered other people. Even when he was unjustly arrested, even when he was being crucified, he refused to retaliate. You know, he didn't call down some curse from heaven against Pilate or the people who were killing him. What did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them. Exactly. And at the cross, Jesus, our Savior, took our punishment. He bore God's wrath on all of our sins. He was wounded for all our filthy speech so that we can be forgiven of it all. You see, if our hearts are to be changed, we must receive that implanted word. We must reflect again on what the Lord Jesus has done for us. Have you done that already this morning? Have you received the Lord Jesus? as your Saviour and Lord. Allow him to come into your heart as your King. If you've not yet done that, please can I urge you to do so, because only he can save your soul. But of course, the, the point here is that the gospel is not just something that saves us. It's something that continues to transform us. We must not stop listening to the implanted word. God has implanted the word in our hearts so that we will go on listening to it. Every day we need to fix our eyes again on Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, as he's described in chapter 2, verse 1. We need to think again of all the wonderful things he has done for us. It is as we reflect on the gospel that our anger will be soothed, that our speech will be purified. It's only when a true faith is dwelling in our hearts as we reflect on all Jesus has done, well, then it will inevitably lead to transformed speech. So let me say to you this morning, if you feel convicted about how you speak, if you know that you need to change in certain ways, don't just focus on the externals. Focus on the heart. Don't just try harder Turn your eyes again to the Lord Jesus. And don't despair either, because Jesus can change our hearts. He can save our souls. He can purify our speech. 
And from that, that clean heart, renewed by the gospel, well, inevitably will come forth loving words, thankful words, content words, encouraging words, words that flow from our faith, words that are thankful for all Jesus has done for us. Well, will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the good news of the gospel. Thank you that although our hearts are so black with sin, Jesus, our Savior, died for us. Lord, we confess to you our sins this morning. We know that we have sinned against you in what we have thought, what we have said, what we have done. Lord, please forgive us. Indeed, uh, enable us to turn our eyes again to the Lord Jesus. May you melt our hearts, change our hearts, so that our speech would be purified and our lives would truly glorify you. Lord, help us to have undivided speech that matches our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name.